Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. On today's episode, a very important conversation about everything that we are now uh, thinking about and talking about and protesting about in the wake of the death of George Floyd and yet another police killing of an African-American citizen of this country. Uh, my guest uh, in a uh, unusual episode in the number of guests we have on, but boy, did they all contribute so much and so well to uh, the conversation we're having today. Uh, Alvin Bragg, a former New York state prosecutor and, and federal prosecutor. Uh, Kristen Clark, who's executive director of the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights. And Victoria Davis, who's a community organizer and activist in New York City, who lost her brother. Uh, to a police killing and has been uh, actively engaging in uh, conversation and advocacy on the issue of police accountability in New York. Uh, talking all of us today about uh, what what can we do? What are some concrete uh, steps that we all need to take? Uh, not just in the police uh, departments, uh, of our cities and towns, not just in the legislature, uh, state and federal, but what can each and every one of us be doing and thinking about and talking about on the issue of racism in this country and the ways that racism affects uh, law enforcement, the way it affects police, the way it affects our criminal justice system, and just about every aspect of our lives in this country. A great, important, stirring, provocative conversation with my guests. I hope everyone continues to stay safe and well, and that you enjoy this episode of Good Law Bad. Today we're talking about uh, what we can actually do about the issues that so many across the country and every community across the country are protesting today about, first of all, police violence uh, in the wake of the George Flood murder uh, in Minnesota, and more broadly, what we can do, what are some concrete steps that we can take now to address the broader issue of institutionalized racism and inequality in our country. And to help us with this enormously difficult topic, but I hope one that is positive because we're going to be talking about things we can actually do, all of us in the country. Our three guests joining on the podcast today, each of whom has a unique, uh, direct, uh, and very powerful connection to this issue. First of all, and welcome Victoria Davis, uh, Kristen Clark, and Alvin Brass. Thank you all very much for being on Good Law, Bad Law today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce each of you so people know a little bit about you. Uh, and then I know, Kristen, you have to uh, go and can't stay with us the uh, uh, for the entire conversation, so I'm going to come to you first. But let's introduce everybody first of all. Uh, Alvin, uh, tell us a little bit about your background uh, as a law professor and your work for the New York Attorney General's Office. Thank you. Uh, so I was a federal and a state prosecutor before becoming uh, a uh, professor at New York Law School. I focused uh, as a federal prosecutor on uh, public corruption and, and uh, uh, policing issues, and has, has sort of been the thread through my career. At the Attorney General's office, uh, I had the privilege of serving as the Chief Deputy Attorney, overseeing the whole office. Uh, but before that, specifically oversaw uh, a, a unit that was responsible for investigating and prosecuting uh, police officers and law enforcement uh, in matters arising from 
deaths of unarmed uh, civilians. Uh, and now I'm at, at New York Law School as a professor and I co-direct our racial justice project. And mm -hmm. we are continuing to do public accountability work. Last time I had the privilege of being on your show, we were talking about a matter that we had then recently filed and still being litigated on behalf of uh, members of the Eric Garner family and police accountability organizers seeking uh, more details about Mr. Garner's death. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, and Victoria, uh, I understand that you are a an organizer in New York City and uh, specifically around the issue of police accountability. Tell, tell us just briefly a little bit about yourself and uh, some of the work that you're doing on that issue. Yes. So for the sake of time, for Kristen, I'll just briefly uh, introduce myself and then we'll come back some more later. But yes, I am an activist organizer in New York City. I got into this line of work because my brother, Delron Small, was killed by an NYPD officer. Uh, Delron was unarmed. The police officer was in an imminent danger. Delron was with his four month old son. And it's just the police officer escalating the situation resulted in Delron's death. So since then, I do a lot of work around police accountability, but I also do work uh, around tra uh, transgender rights, the rights for black mm -hmm. trans women, and just a whole host of other things. And I guess we can get into those things later. So sure. I'll pass okay. on Kristen. <laughs> yeah, well, before before that, just, just so people will understand, and first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss and death of your brother. Um, but just so people know, what happened to the police officer who was involved in your brother's death, if anything? So, so the police officer was charged at, uh, through the state attorney general's office, and that's actually how I know Alvin. Okay. Because his administration uh, were the ones who had prosecuted and really, and I feel really truly believed in Delron's case. Well, Wayne, Wayne Isaac's case and Delron's murder, right? And so they worked really hard. However, after a few weeks of trial, I'm not really sure if it was six weeks, um, but it's, it's, I believe it was somewhere like five or six weeks of uh, being on trial, the officer was found not guilty. And I don't at all believe it had anything to do with misrepresentation from uh, the administration that Alvin served under. And I'm very clear about that because there are two different administrations. And because of my experience working under the previous administration, I always like to separate the two. Uh, politically, mm -hmm. people they just say it's the same thing for me and for a for me as a person who's directly impacted, who uh, went through this experience, I feel that it's very important to highlight that this experience is, wasn't the experience I hear from other families. And so that's why I continue to say the administration that Alvin was under. So mm -hmm. I just believe that the jurors didn't follow instructions and they okay. Gave him they gave the officer privilege as a police officer instead of following the guidelines for the charges. Okay, and that's and we'll want to get into that because obviously that's you know that's been a pattern when it, in the, on the rare times when these cases do get prosecuted, uh, that's something that we've certainly seen in many many other cases. So we'll want to come back to that, of course. Uh, but let me let me introduce. Uh, my third guest, Kristen Clark, uh, also a uh, uh, return guest onto the podcast, the uh, executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights uh, in Washington, D.C. So, Kristen, welcome. And tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, your organization. I know you also worked in the Department of Justice. Uh, so just give us a brief introduction about yourself, please. Yeah, thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, giving us space to have this important discussion. Um, and I want to first thank Victoria for sharing her story and um, for her courage 
and extend my condolences on her loss. I am always amazed by the mothers of the movement, the families impacted by police violence, um, and amazed by their courage and their ability to use their loss to advance the cause of justice. So, so Absolutely. thank you. Um, so I lead an organization called the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. We're a national civil rights organization founded in 1963 at the request of John F. Kennedy, who put out a call to action to the private bar. The lawyers all across the country, and his charge to them was to roll up your sleeves and figure out how you can engage in the civil rights fight. And so that's what we do each and every day. Um, what makes us a unique organization is that we are about the partnership with um, the private bar that offers up critical pro bono support for our work. I've got a board of over 200 lawyers representing 160 law firms, and I'm so proud um, to uh, have Alvin Bragg, my uh, dear friend and colleague, um, serve on our board. Um, we couldn't do our work without the, the help and support of the private bar, especially not now, because the challenges that we face in this moment are are so significant and complex. And um, the, the, the problems that we're talking about are ones that we won't figure out tomorrow if they will take years for us to, to fully address and resolve. And so the, the role of the private bar uh, in this moment is, is so critical. And that's what we do at the, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. We leverage that pro bono support each and every day. Well, let me, now that we, we've introduced everybody, and I know, again, Kristen, you have to go um, before too long, I want to start with you. Um, obviously, there are many dimensions to uh, what we're seeing in the, in the specific case of, of what happened with George Flood, Floyd, uh, but also the broader issues that so many communities uh, urban and rural and suburban states uh, with issues of, uh, of police violence, uh, and then even more broadly with, you know, issues that we're feeling so acutely now. Uh, you know, let's not forget we're in the midst of a, of a pandemic that, and how could we forget, uh, that is that is, is significantly uh, and disproportionately affecting uh, you know, African Americans in and, and, and other minorities in our country, uh, as well as the economic impact uh, that they're disproportionately feeling with tens of millions of people uh, newly unemployed. Um, what, I, I, as I said at the outset, I really want to try to, as much as we can, we're addressing some very big problems. And as you say, it's going to take years to feel like we're making real progress. Uh, which we have to absolutely uh, make at this point. Uh, what are some specific things? Is, is, it, is it cases that need to be brought in court? Is it advocacy that needs to take place? And, and, and specifically on what issues, perhaps starting on the, on the, on the most specific issue of police violence. What, what is yeah. your perspective on that, Chris? And what, what are things that you'd like to see done starting right away? So I have a lot of people asking me that question right now. And I don't always start off like this as a civil rights lawyer, but I really think it's important to just press, press pause and to breathe and to remember why we're here and why we're having this conversation. Because of George Floyd and Breonna mm -hmm. Taylor and Eric Garner and Philando Castile and Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland Juan McDonald, Little Tamir Rice, Jordan Davis, Victoria's son, and so many others. There are not enough hashtags or time on this podcast to cover the endless list of black lives lost unnecessarily to police violence. And I think it's just important to, to center ourselves and understand that the road ahead is going to be a long one, but we need to find the courage this time to figure out how we can really address these issues because the list has been growing for far too long. So that's the first thing. The second thing 
is having hard, courageous conversations with everyone in our network, in our family, the people we work with, about racism, about white supremacy, about racial discrimination. I think that um, for many lawyers, you know, we've come up and, you know, we talk about um, discrimination and violations of civil rights laws. And, you know, that's not where we are in 2020. Our, the language has changed and we've come around to embracing the dark, ugly, grim reality of where we are as a nation. And, and white supremacy is not a thing from a, a bygone era. It is right now. This is what we are contending with and what is fueling a lot of the ugly violence that we're talking about. It's what it's what's behind the death of Ahmad Armory shot down in broad daylight. And and so as as lawyers, I think it's important for us to make sure that we're using the right vocabulary and we're not afraid to use it. We are talking about African Americans, about black people who who are, are victims of, of ugly racial violence in our country. So once we do that work, the centering and, and the language, then I think we got a, a framework where we can now start to talk about the, the reforms and the work ahead. Well, I want to I want to jump in on that. It's such an important point. And uh, I, I have to say, when, when you were on the podcast the first time, Kristen, we were talking about white supremacists. There was a very important case that you were handling where white supremacists had targeted uh, the African-American uh, head of the student body at American University. So I think a lot of people now, maybe more than ever in the Trump era, uh, have, have a, at least a passing understanding of what we mean when we say white supremacists in that context. But I also have to say, I just drove across the country with my 21-year-old a daughter who I was helping move out to the, uh, the Bay Area. And one of the conversations that we had in the car was about white supremacy, as you just used it a moment ago. And I have to admit, I may say, I have to confess, I didn't, I, I, I kind of hurtled a little bit when she used that term because I, I didn't understand how she was using that term. And we talked about it for hours because we had a lot of hours in the car together. And I do now understand what she meant by that. And I, I think it's so incredibly important to understand that concept. Uh, so I want, you to, I want you to say a bit more about it, because I agree. If we're not talking the same language, then uh, white people aren't going to understand what black people are even talking about. And, and it's so, so important to do that, to understand the, the, the broader significance and the historical experience that, that informs why these protests today uh, are, 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 are an inflection point in, in our country's history. So tell us a little yeah. bit more about that. Yeah. Well, we, we're talking about the legacy of slavery, which is what defines the roots of our nation. Black people brought here in slaves and deemed regard, you know, not deemed a full person, three fifths of a person. Um, it is about the degradation and dehumanization of black people throughout the test of time. It's about lynchings. It's about a justice system that protects uh, the lynch man. It's about the Ku Klux Klan and uh, a justice system that covers up their crimes or is complicit in their crimes. It's about being comfortable today with black people um, who are dying at higher rates from a pandemic that impacts arguably everybody equally, but because of racism baked into our healthcare system and into every aspect of society has rendered black people more vulnerable. It's about the white supremacists today who are marching through the streets, hoodless and out in the open, and who um, target black people with impunity, um, who harass them, who plan marches like in Charlottesville, um, who carry out violence uh, without fear of the consequences. That, that is ugly white supremacy, and, and that is at the root of the problems that we are trying to grapple with right now. 
And once we really wrap our arms around that, then I think we can start to roll up our sleeves and start to talk about reforms and policies and the work at hand. Well, and, and you know, the, the concept of white supremacy, you know, you know, uh, a white person might say, well, I'm not a white supremacist like those neo-Nazis, like, like those sort of neo-Ku Klux planners. So what do you mean? What do you mean white supremacy as it applies to me? And that's, I mean, that's something that, you know, that I'm, again, I'm confessing here that I'm becoming more enlightened about and understand that I have so much to learn and understand about that. But we all have to really understand that to really get at the root, the deep, deep root of what what causes uh, all of these expressions of racism today, whether it's economic, social interactions with, with law enforcement, policies, uh, in business, in law. I mean, how, how do you think, uh, as a lawyer, as a civil rights lawyer, someone who worked in the Department of Justice yourself, I mean, how do you, in what you're doing, start to, uh, start to engage in action? Right now, the action is taking place on the street. How do we go from that to action that can bring about change? Yeah. So now, now we're into the the roll up sleeve, roll up your sleeve part of the conversation. <laughs> and right. you know, I'm really heartened by a lot of the action that we're seeing this week. Um, there are members of Congress right now who are thinking very deeply about what a comprehensive police reform package needs to, you know, what it must look like. And um, people who are talking about criminal justice reform and police reform at the state level, those conversations are happening. But I think that a lot of the folks who are on the street still leveraging their voices and demonstrating, I have deep frustration with the systems, with our institutions, and the slow pace of them, and the politicization, which often, you know, blocks important uh, reform efforts from ever really reaching the finish line and truly seeing the light of day. So I think this moment for, for lawyers is going to feel a little frustrating because it's not mm -hmm. going to be a kind of cookie cutter uh, approach of where we just, you know, put a bill together and snap our fingers and we fix this problem. I think people are on the street bringing pressure because there's some things that you can't fix by, um, the, you know, uh, the four corners of a document. How do we change the culture of policing? How do we get rid uh, from the system white supremacy that infects the ranks of policing uh, in some communities? How do we get rid of that warrior mentality where officers too often feel like they have to take a militarized stance with communities? And how do we put in place a guardian mentality where we have officers doing what we saw this weekend in places like Flint, Michigan and Camden, New Jersey, marching arm in arm with 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 the community um so that kind of culture change you know that's going to be the frustrating part for listeners that that that's going to be work that really you know gets played out at the grassroots level at the community yeah. level and and get you know and, and it's work frankly led by by the folks who are demonstrating and and marching every day right now um it is a it is a cry a clarion call for overhaul of the, the the culture of policing in, in in our country. Well, and 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 recognizing, yes, it's the people who are raising their voices in the streets too. But I don't think enough attention. You know, I've seen photos of police officers kneeling with protesters. Yeah. Um, so some amount of change can happen within departments if those people become more influential. Uh, you know, the president who is saying he wants to call out the U.S. military on citizens of this country. We need to have people engaged, too. I would think this is an election year. There are going to be elections not only for president, but for, for the Senate, for the House, for state office, for local races. I mean, people, if, if, if you're going to ch try to be changing the conversation, people need to be engaged at all levels. As you say, it's grassroots levels in all of these different arenas to, to bring yeah. people into place who who have a more um, you know have have a more 
educated and enlightened view of, of the roots of these issues. I think that seems like that's essential as well. That's right. That's right. And you mentioned President Trump, and you know, it's such a moment that that requires and demands um, leadership at the national level. But if if tension levels were eight on a one to ten scale, you know, he shoots it up to to fifteen every right. time. And I think that's unfortunate because I do think that the the demonstrations present a unique moment for the country to confront these issues in a way that we haven't pre previously, and that there is a lot of, of hope and desire for for reform, um, reforms that Alvin talks about each and every day, and that so many of us have been working towards. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where President Trump is not obstructing possibility for, for possibilities for progress and reform. That's so long well, with you. Well, just I mean, one final thought, and then I know you have to go, and we'll keep chatting with with Victoria and Alvin. But you mentioned uh, President Kennedy, who you know placed the call for your organization to be created. I mean, that was a time when the Department of Justice that you served in was an agent for change, we had a leadership role, uh, continuing into the Johnson years on on issues of civil rights. We're not seeing anything like that at all. We're seeing the opposite of that now. Uh, you know, but not only his language, his Twitter feed, and all of that, but but actually canceling and defunding programs uh, that that were passed, on, you know, in the prior administration to try to try to help with some of these issues. President Trump com comes along and cancels those. Uh, so so hopefully, you know, we can look forward to to leadership from the federal, you know, from the federal authorities as well again. Yeah. Yeah, the Justice Department, where I started off my career, it's our nation's highest law enforcement agency. And I think people who've come through the ranks feel really proud about, you know, their, their time working for a, an agency that is to be committed to equal justice under law. And um, a lot of communities, I think, feel hopeless in part because we haven't seen a lot of good work come out of the Justice Department in a few years, in the last few years. In fact, we've seen a real rollback on. Yeah. Uh, work dealing with systemic um, police misconduct, among other issues. Well, Kristen, thank you. I know you have to go, and I really appreciate you uh, you speaking with us today. And I'm, uh, uh, we'll, we'll turn the conversation to Victoria and to Alvin. And, and again, Kristen, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. So. Victoria, let me, you know, Kristen, I think, kind of how, you know, helped us in broad strokes uh, with, with the scope of what has to be done. And I think her raising the importance of what has to be done at the grassroots level uh, is a great segue to you and, and some of the work you're doing. Um, I know that you, you, some of the focus of your work as a community organizer has been on the issue of police accountability. Um, I yeah. wonder if you could start and help us understand what 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 we should understand that concept to mean. What is police accountability? Okay, so police accountability. Uh, for me, I like to use the, the term police accountability. So thank you for that. Uh, I know I had met with the listener maybe about a few months ago. I, I think right before the pandemic. And it was regarding my brother. And what I had stated in that meeting was, I'm not asking for justice, I'm not demanding justice, because justice wasn't written for black people, justice isn't here for black people. Accountability is what I was there to demand and what I will always demand, because accountability for, for me is uh, holding a person accountable for the wrongs that they have done or that make we or I feel they have done and hopefully giving them an opportunity to make it right or just, you know, kind of like just righting the wrong. The judicial system historically uh, just wasn't written for Black people. We weren't in mind when the Constitution was written. Uh, we were considered property, three-fifths of a person, and we see in different systems, so uh, 
you know, systemic racism or systemic um, issues, right? That's mm-hmm. part of it. We weren't mm-hmm. there. We weren't in mind. Mm-hmm. So right. when when these is, and injustices are happening, they're not happening because something is wrong. They're not happening because something is broken. They're happening because that's the way that it was written. And I think the larger conversation is the accountability part of it. How do we move forward? How do we change this? How, what, and, it's, and, and, and when I say we, I'm not really talking about black people, right? Um, that conversation within the black community has to be held within the black community uh, on a different level, right, of accountability. But for white people and how they are going to be allies with us and mm-hmm. how, you know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know how. And I'll say, well, you, even like earlier your confession, that's standing in solidarity. That's, that's mm-hmm. being honest about mm-hmm. what you don't know. And, and it's almost like, okay, I want to be in solidarity, but I will honestly say I don't know. And that's right. okay. And that's accountability. So holding ourselves accountable first and then holding institutions that have not allowed black people to move forward in a way where we are not being killed by the police and then everything is turned off, closed off, forgotten about, and we're waiting for the next sensational victim to come along. Uh, we have to address different systems. That can be the, the, the Department of Education. That's also a system that can be, that had, that can be and has been oppressive to black people, right? Like the special education system. So it's not just police uh, who can oppress and who can uh, hold black people back, but it's the system in itself where black people aren't anything. Like we're not in line, we're not, we're not treated equitably. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, Victoria, I think it's such a, I think it's such a huge point about individual accountability, and I wasn't, I wasn't really trying to make myself the example, but uh, ultimately, police officers are individuals. They're human beings. They're individuals. Uh, people like Alvin, who served as prosecutors, are individuals. People who serve as jurors at trials of these cases are individual. So mm-hmm. if if you don't have individual accountability on the big, broad, 400-year-old issue of racism in this country, mm-hmm. then you can, you can very easily say, well, that's not my problem. That doesn't involve me. That's not something I have to be concerned about. But if you have individual <laughs> accountability, then we're all part of the problem. We all can be part of the of, of helping to try to make that problem, uh, you know, try to help solve that problem. So, how do you? I mean, is that how do you, as a community organizer, you know, is it conversation? Is it uh, is it education? Is it uh, is it protest? I mean, protests are. I, I I have to imagine having a pretty significant impact. Uh, already, um, what what are some of the ways you, as a community organizer, from where you work and live, feel that uh, individual accountability can be advanced? Okay, thank you for that. So, all of the things that you stated are all important. Uh, we're all born as a, we're all born as an individual. Is that as that? conversation actually all last on um, all this week, right? So we're all individuals and then we have our careers, right? And we have our allies or the things that we do. So even for police officers, uh there's the conversation all the time of um but there are good officers. Mm-hmm. So I believe in Rasta Blanc, people are born with a clean slate. I don't believe babies are evil. 
I believe babies are born with a clean slate. And then nature and nurture starts to kick in. And then people learn different behaviors and different things, right? And so I, I feel that when we have officers who join the, the police force and they may not fully understand their history or the history of oppression, that can be very dangerous. Or if they, their intentions are to feel a little more powerful and then you put them in these positions where you tell them that they're powerful, then they're misusing that power, that, that quote unquote power, right? Uh, and also I, when I speak of, because it also confuses people, I just want to highlight this because it confuses people. Delron was killed by a black officer, right? And I'm very comfortable speaking about race. So um, Delron was killed by a black officer. And I think that that's a very important conversation to have. Because oftentimes mm. when I say that to people, they gasp. So I'll ask mm. them, like, why? Why are you so surprised by that? And they're like, no, because black officers don't kill black people. I said, really? Mm. They don't? Why would you say that? <laughs> And then yeah. they're like, well, maybe, maybe he really was scared. Really? Why would you think that? Because Delron was unarmed. He, he didn't think he was armed. He was armed. He, he has the backing of the CBA. So what was there to be afraid of when he chose to roll down his window? When he chose not to drive off, to drive off, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What was mm -hmm. he afraid of? Actually, he was in the position of power, right? So what I feel is, and, and actually, um, what I feel is when the hiring practices are a little odd, when police officers, especially black police officers and, and, and Latino officers, officers of color are being hired, they're looking for mili like kind of like a military cut style officer, not mm. officers who are relatable to the community, not officers mm. who are trying to, but like I, I often feel like, these officers of color, black officers and officers of color are saying, I don't want to be seen as one of them. I want to be seen as a different type of black person. I, I'm, mm. I'm a different type of black person. And when we have that type of thinking and we're, we're putting a vest on a person and we're giving them a gun and they're going out there and they're trying to prove that they are a different type of Latina, they're a different type of Asian, different type of black person, then this, that's a recipe for disaster because then they don't have respect for the very communities that they are supposedly serving and supposedly mm -hmm. protecting. And so they get out there and they're doing neither. So, 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 so when people talk about the militarization of the police, you're, you're saying that even at the level of hiring, when decisions are made about what types of individuals we want serving or, or the people who are doing the hiring are, are saying when they look at who they want serving, they're actually mm -hmm. looking through a very militaristic lens in, in even the hiring process. Right. They're kind of looking for someone who, who's like kind of pure, like, you know, however they can, however that looks on paperwork, someone who doesn't have much ties to their community. We all know the disadvantages that um, black communities and communities of color face, right? So then if you're only looking for people who have, who don't have a, even a scratch in their background, then this may be, this just may be a person who is so far removed from their own community and their own family that when they get out there, they're not seeing they're not seeing us as family. They're not seeing us as their brothers and sisters. And they're not seeing us as people who deserve protection. They're seeing us as other people. And so mm -hmm. that's why I make a point to always explain to people, Dalron was killed by a black officer. Because I think mm -hmm. it's very important to understand that it's not just white police officers to kill. And I, and I believe that when people join the police department, Right? I believe a lot of people have good intentions. I think most people have good intentions. The, the, uh, the benefits are uh, enticing. 
at some point I was going to join as well because the benefits are enticing. I'm a city employee, mm-hmm. right? I was like, well, mm-hmm. I'll be able to retire in 20 years. I'll mm-hmm. get a pay raise, all these things, right? However, if we're not doing a real psychosocial on these people, not just a lie detector test, I mean, like a psychosocial that involves uh, racial bias, bias, um, classism. We're not at this. If we're not speaking to these these candidates about classism, el- elitism, uh, capitalism, and just how they think, when we're putting them out into these communities, uh, they're not going to behave the way that people think police are supposed to behave when they're out in their communities, and then they will be confused. They'll say, but how did that black officer kill that black man or woman? How? And, community, and people are genuinely confused because I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. People say it to me. Well, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like you're now talking about training and how So there's, there, there's a certain culture in a police department that's a product of, as you pointed out, the types of hiring that, that, that is done, but also culture that develops through the training and through the experience that they have uh, in their work. How, what can you share about that that you've seen through your work? And where, where do you think we could make progress in terms of understanding better the training and how, how that can be improved? I think that there needs to be actual uh, conversation. We see often when police officers have transgressions that the first thing the CBS makes sense is we're going to retrain them. We're going to send them for retraining, right? Yeah. Um, I've seen sometimes with some training, but the trainings are on the computer. You put yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. I see conceptual harassment training on a computer. That, that, like, so it's been retraining. It's really, it's not about retraining. It's about really understanding what's going on in that person's mind. Why did you think that that person's life was not valuable enough for you to not escalate a situation to the point that you ended this person's life, putting other people's lives in danger most of the time, other civilians, right? And in the wrong case, it's the children that were inside of the car. Um, and also, like, police officers don't feel that they're off of work. They don't, they don't, it's as if they don't feel that they're off of work, like as if it's a religion almost, like they're always a police officer. And as mm-hmm. I asked someone yesterday, because she justified it, my friend, and I said to her, so when doctors are always on call, from what I understand, I've never seen a doctor walk around and look for people and just start testing their blood pressure. Hey, I need to see if you're sick. Get over here. I need to check right. your blood pressure, right? right, right. <laughs> I've never sure. seen fire firefighters go around looking for fire. Hey, I need to see if there's a fire over there. You know, like, so you're off of work. You have blocked out. But they're behaving as if this is their life. Mm-hmm. They're behaving as if they are protecting some unknown entity. I don't really understand the psychology behind it, but I know that it's very odd. When I watch the videos of the protesters being um, beaten and it's just like so aggressive, and I'm like, sir, you're going to clock out of work in about an hour. You do know that this is your job. But it, it, it's just that it takes on a whole life of its own, and I don't think training is enough. I think that it's understanding the history of policing and moving forward. But I also don't believe in pretending that um, we're just going to say, okay, we're going to twitch our nose like you would, and tomorrow there will be no more police. Because it's not true. That's not what's going to happen, right? right. It's not what's going to happen. So then what do we do? What is the answer? I feel that one of the answers is, Having people be honest. If you're gonna if you're gonna hook people up to machines and ask them questions, ask them questions about their their implicit biases. Ask them about race and class and just all of those things and then we'll get a feel. And maybe mm. the candidate pool will probably be so small, maybe we won't even have it much <laughs> we probably won't even have it. <laughs> no. 
Well, let me, Alvin, let me bring you in on this because we're, you know, there's, there's now again, that's tragically why we need to be having this conversation. What has led us to be in this moment, uh, George Floyd's death and, and others too, long list that Chris just read, only a partial list even then. Um, as a, as a former prosecutor and as one who studies and, and researches and, and teaches uh, on, the, on these issues, uh, I mean, obviously, and, and I as a lawyer understand this too, the issue of accountability is, is important for the individual case, but also holding someone accountable for a wrong serves other purposes. In, in the message it sends, and the and the lack of accountability on the other side sends a very different message. Uh, we've heard how quote unquote difficult these cases are uh, to bring. Um, is that the issue? Is it that the cases are difficult? Is it that the law makes these cases difficult, or is it more? the kinds of things that we've been talking about so far, really individual attitudes, uh, a lack of real education and understanding, not just checking boxes on an online quiz, but, but real deep understanding that leads to uh, a lack of accountability. What, what are your thoughts about that? So I, I, I will unpack it, but my just front is all of the, everything we've talked about the last, uh, you know, our you know, the, the the structural racism, the history of racism. Uh, you know, Kristen went back. I would add to that list. You know, you know, Dred Scott. Uh, Victoria mm-hmm. talked about black people's property. You know, Dred Scott Supreme Court ruling, where the Supreme Court said that you know, uh, a white person, uh, you know, a black person has no rights that a white person is bound to respect. Uh, you know, going through Emmett Till and the tying. I do think understanding that that's the the connective tissue. Um, that, as as Victoria talked about with. Uh, 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 Del Ron states that it, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's race, there's power, um, and then there's a systemic structure, um, and and it can happen to a, a black officer. So I, I want to talk about, about about that case. I do want to pause on something Victoria said really struck me, and just wanted to share. So in talking about recruitment and the effect of you know, so this circular effect of mass incarceration on recruitment. Of, of African Americans into law enforcement. When I applied to be an assistant United States attorney, um, I, you know, I got the job. Uh, the job offer was made, I think, in a, in January. And then there's a, uh, understandably, a, 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 a very probing background check uh, mm-hmm. to, to before you can become a federal prosecutor. And in filling those materials out, uh, you know, they want to know who lives with you at the time. I, close family member living with me who had a you know, significant uh, uh, criminal history record. And that became a very significant issue in my background check, which ultimately ended up, if I got the job, let's say, in January, I didn't start until I was offered and cleared until somewhere around October. Um, oh and a significant driver um, was, you know, of at least a few months in their delay was that. And so when Victoria talked about you're squeaky clean, it's not even so much what you've done. It's, it's, it's you know, family members in, 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 the, in connection with my process. And it wasn't even sort of about, you know, culpability. It was the number of arrests, things like that, um, mm-hmm. you know, charges. Now, there were some convictions as well. But her, her, her saying that made me think about it, it was it almost you know, women, I think I, I served well and I added, added dimensions to the office that were not there, I think. And it almost didn't happen because of the point that Victoria raised about a, a background mm-hmm. check, which in many ways, if you're going to have that sort of a screen, that's going to, uh, given uh, criminal history records and, and a history of enforcement in this country, that's going to affect African Americans more. So I wanted to say that first. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. your, your question, I do, I mean, it is, it's, all, it's a confluence of factors. So, um, and it's systemic accountability in addition to individual accountability. We've got a whole system, you know, accountable. I mean, some of these cases in some jurisdictions, 
when it looks like it's a case that you know, a jury may it, it bring a conviction on, they opt to try it in front of a judge. And so then where you just have sort of a judge sometimes, uh, you know, if you know you've got a judge, who's quote unquote, a, you know, police officer judge, you know, and every, anyone who's yeah. back to the courthouse knows the leanings and, and biases of particular mm-hmm. judges. Um, so those kind of kind of systemic issues put in. And you do have matters of the law. I mean, the standard in New York, uh, where we would have sort of, you know, is to, before you can use deadly force as an officer and be justified as a matter of law, the officer has to have a, a reasonable belief that uh, it is necessary to use deadly force to protect that officer's life uh, or a third person or serious bodily injury. Uh, and in that, that standard, when said, you know, to the jury, does not, you know, necessary, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, means, you know, need, but it's sort of a spectrum, right? Um, it doesn't, doesn't, isn't read and, and breathe life into a jury where it's absolute necessity. So I think one, one law change that would be meaningful in this state is to say, no, no, when we say necessary, we mean necessary. Right. So we mean if there's any other way that you or that third person uh, who, who you're sworn to protect uh, um, can 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 avoid, uh, you know, death or serious bodily injury, you got to take that step. Um, and that's not how the way the law is instructed to juries. And so that is a significant point. We have some law reform which we can do. Uh, but more fundamentally, to sort of the the, the people uh, and the individuals in the system, you were talking about everyone's an individual. Um, Victoria talked about Delron's case, which was, uh, for me, the lowest professional moment of my life. I got to know uh, uh, Victoria, I got to know her brother Victor, um, and, you know, we poured our heart and souls into that case, and it was not until the jury came back uh, that, 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 you know, I was shocked. I was shocked in terms mm-hmm. of their outcome. And, you know, picked the jury, very diverse jury in Brooklyn, um, and I think the, that I'm inclined to, 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 to agree with Victoria based on there was some reporting afterwards in terms of how the jurors interpret some instruction. So there's sort of a legal instruction issue. But I also think there's a, there is a sense, there's a sort of difference. We're all, all, all of us, maybe not all, a lot of us in the society, you know, are trained cops and robbers at age two um, and running around. And there's this sense of, you know, deference to the officers in the courtroom. A police officer could not have done something wrong. I tried a, a, a case where an FBI agent was a defendant, uh, where he he lied and our view had obstructed justice. And very sadly, when I went into court that first day of trial, it was the first time I felt the presumption of innocence in any of the trials, which is terrible because we're all entitled to that if we're if we're before a court of law. And the, the FBI agent sort of had it had an Uber presumption mm-hmm. and, yeah. and some of that i think comes from <clears throat> deep rooted police some of it, look we want people to trust police but we got to have it have an understanding that that trust can be abused we've also done a lot of public corruption work and sometimes elected can have the same phenomenon but it's really deeply rooted with police um and we want people to be able to you know we, we you know we want people to be able to go into this profession we want it to have a uh, uh, uh something that, that people feel good about but it cannot be so that every single time, uh, uh, you know, when we when we look at it, it's like, oh, well, the officer, he had a reasonable belief that, and that, that, that is, you know, you can fill in the blank. And it's usually that, you know, some version or other of this black man on the other side was very dangerous. And that is the history of sort of uh, the, the country's history of correlating, uh, you know, danger with color of skin. So there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in terms of both law reform, but also, um, you know, dealing with these deep-seated biases. And we can't, um, we can't disassociate them. We have to do both. Uh, but, but I wanted to, if, if, if I could, because you said you wanted some, you know, kind of specific things. And I think we've covered the, you know, you know, big stuff that we have to do that we wrestle with as a country. We need to, you know, wrestle and talk about race, not in this episodic way where we go from mm-hmm. one instance to another, but in a continued, sustained, and real way. Um, you know, we have to talk about law reform and how these cases are done. Um, but but I think more broadly, how we're approaching um, policing, and, and from my perspective as a as a former prosecutor, someone who's a candidate for, for to be a district attorney, thinking more proactively 
about how we uh, try to address things. So I think a big piece of this is, sh is shrinking the system, being, being proactive in what the system looks like. We have far too many encounters that are charged encounters in terms of, you know, how we come to be able to charge, not in terms of the case, but in terms of the emotional level. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and as someone who's been stopped at gunpoint multiple times, mm -hmm. you know, we look at how stop and frisk, the number of stops, um, and then we look at how the stops went down because of a policy change, um, and we remain safer. Right. When I was at the Attorney General's office, we worked on a report that showed that 0.1% of the, you know, you know, tons and tons of stops, only 0.1% resulted in convictions for a violent crime. This was not something that made us safer, but what it was something that it was, it, it, it led to all of these incidents, which were, which, which could, all of which, you know, any of which could have, you know, gone wrong. Right. You know, and, and Each is an opportunity for something to go bad. Yeah. Right. So shrinking yeah. the system, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, stop and frisk, and I should parenthetically note, stop and frisk is down, but the racial disparities of who's stopped persist. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, shrinking the system, shrinking some of these law enforcement steps, you know, we had, you know, before uh, the last couple of weeks, we were having a discussion in New York, and Victoria and I both testified in front of the city council on the NYPD's role in social distancing enforcement. We got a public health issue. We got tons of trained uh, uh, medical health professionals. We've got community leaders, uh, but yet we've got the NYPD out enforcing social distancing, and in a disparate way. The statistics and the right. anecdotes both right. show. There's another way. Like, why? Why are we? Why are we even doing that? Which is a starting point. I think shrinking the system and and not having uh, uh, giving rise to uh, all of those you know possible um, bad incidents. And then on the flip side of that point is having more uh, having more non-policing interactions. So you know most folks think of the district attorney as someone they you know see in court and they don't want to be there, but we need a more affirming role where we're sort of out in the community. You know, having conversations about no, what what makes you safer, um, and so that when we have these interactions, um, those are building affirmative trust and relationships. Uh, that you know, when we did have to have more challenging, well, those would be challenging conversations, but more policing based conversations. There's a there's a there's a relationship. So I think that is fundamental here as we move forward. That these incidents, it's not like we've mass incarceration on one hand, and on the other hand, we've got. Uh, you know these these police involve uh, uh, killing. They're interrelated. So I think that's well. I wonder. I mean, that's all. Yeah, that all of that is so fascinating and important, Alvin. And uh, you know, I wonder, and I don't know if this is this may sound a little bit out of left field, but maybe it isn't so much. You know, a lot of people are saying because of the pandemic, which has completely devastated local and state budgets. Uh, as the economy, you know, has been shut down in response, a lot of states, uh, in my state of Pennsylvania, even Republican uh, state legislators are talking about legalization of marijuana. And, you know, a lot of the mass incarceration that we now have is because of 30 years of enforcement, of so-called enforcement of basically small-time drug charges. Uh, I imagine a lot of the increase in the size of police forces that you're suggesting we could afford to have be much smaller uh, is, again, because of, uh, you know, drug enforcement. That's not necessarily directly a racial issue other than that it's been, you know, disparately enforced and, and the consequences disparately felt. But I wonder as, as, as the move, and I think it's an inevitable march, Towards, towards legalization. I wonder if that could be something that could take place in conjunction with that is a shrinking of the prison population, a shrinking of uh, enforcement, a shrinking of police presence because those things are now legal. So, I, so that is definitely a piece of the puzzle, I think, and there's a robust sort of academic discussion uh, about you know the, the drivers of mass incarceration and and uh, you know the war on drugs uh, being one driver, but also you know other offenses and you know ones that uh, are you know some may deem you know quote unquote a violent offense. Some of these offenses are misclassified. Um, yeah. You know, uh, also being driving.
drivers. And I think, you know, I don't want to resolve the academic debate right here and now, but I do think that in order to make the types of gains in terms of to bring us back into sort of, you know, we're so historically out of line with how many people we incarcerate now, um, that, that, you know, yes, you know, changing in the drug enforcement is, is very important, but it doesn't get us all the way back to sort of even historically normal numbers. You know, we've got many other things, you know, sort of prosecution for, uh, you know, for other types of crimes that lead to people being in the system for a long time and having, you know, being, being staying in because of technical probation and parole violations. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got, um, you know. Issues with bail. And yeah. Bail is also. A yeah. Issue. Pre-trial detention. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So, so, but, it, but I agree that, you know, certainly the, the and, and, and frankly, the, the ones that led to, you know, my, my family members were very drug related offenses that, that, you know, when I talk about my background check, so it's certainly a, a, a mm. piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I think Victoria was actually just leaving uh, uh, prior, prior to our, our conversation. We just had a budget conversation about, yes, if there's a shrinking pie in the budget, what, what pieces, who who gets cut and where those cuts come from and making sure that right. they don't fall disproportionately on, on you know, services that make us, you know, safe um, in terms of our public health and public safety, our summer job programs in the city. Um, you know, we've got, you know, pandemic has hit our nursing homes hard. And, you know, all of that is interrelated related with safety and having a very broad lens on public health and public safety and making sure that we're, you know, we are consistent with, with you know, this is sort of a city conversation. It sounds like it's going on to Philadelphia, too, like having the budget match where, where we, our priorities are. Well, let, let me come back to the issue of accountability because it, it, it actually does tie into what we, we were just now talking about, which is what are our, what are our priorities? What are our priorities in terms of law enforcement, in terms of prosecution, in terms of you know uh, how we envision you know punishment and, and, and prison and all of all of that whole whole system? Um, I'm really bothered by some of what I've read when. Um, you know, commentators say, well, these cases, that is, these abuse cases where, where in the worst case, there's a death, as, as happened to you and your family, Victoria, that these cases are just hard, and that's why, you know, we don't bring more of them. I, you know, I come from, a, a, you know, in my own pursuits professionally, you know, we bring lawsuits often uh, because they need to be brought. And uh, change happens through bringing of cases. Change through, the, in terms of the lives of the people involved directly in that case, but also there are impact cases that have a broader impact even beyond those that are directly involved. Uh, I wonder, uh, and, and, and we're talking today a couple of hours after it was announced that in Minnesota, the Attorney General is now bringing charges with the other three police officers involved uh, in Mr. Floyd's death and that the charges uh, against the, the, the principal police officer, the one who had his knee on his neck for almost nine minutes, have been upgraded to second second degree uh, homicide from, from what had previously been. So, and I think that psychologically as well as uh, a statement about the role of law in these cases, the role law can play not only in terms of accountability, but accountability as a vehicle to real change in the attitude. Can't we just say we want to see more cases brought? I mean, prosecutors should bring these cases. They may not win each and every one, you know, and and tragically, you know, Victoria and your brother's case, it, it resulted in an acquittal. But, you know, sometimes I think these cases have to be brought, even if they suffer defeat in some of them some point, the bringing of the case sets a standard and, and, and makes a statement about what your priorities are as, as a community. I mean, what do, what do you think about that idea? I mean, I mean I'm, 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 you have to do what is, you have to seek justice, right? And so after, and, and after you know, the defense had a press conference after the acquittal, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the murder of Del Ron Small, Sort of, you know, mocking. You know, maybe the prosecutor will think twice before they bring this next time. 
And and you know, again, that was a you know, obviously personally painful for for Victoria and her family. I I, I felt it was it was it was you know, I felt terrible. Um, but I would bring that case. Get it, bringing that case is the right thing to do. Um, yeah, you, you know, I will go to my grave thinking that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are values to a, a, a public, uh, you know, counting. We put the proof out before. Um, you, you know, now I think there are things that there are there are um, lessons learned and things. You know, things in terms of uh, you know the the use of the the media by the defense of that, which is sort of a a classic playbook. Uh, you know, in these you know, you're trying to blame the defeat in some way. Um, you know, I, I I think that there are, um, you know, I would have you know wished that the you know the some of the things that were reported were not reported. Um, so perhaps maybe a gag rule, which is you know sort of you know very hard to come by in, in court. We ask for some things that not be admitted to evidence and prevail, but yet they made their way into sort of the paper. Um, and I think that may have affected the jury. Even though obviously, the jury's not supposed to 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 read that. So so I, I think yes. You, you know, when you when you have the proof, um, you know you must you must bring the case. You're, you 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 know it 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 they they you you want to get the conviction here because you're seeking justice, and that's you know you know we charged the time we thought believed um, had happened, which was a murder charge, uh, and I, so I firmly believe that some of the times when you have these sort of outcome determinative. Uh, oh well, we're not going to bring in that case because we can never, um, you know, never prevail there. It, it sometimes that's pretextual um, and not mm-hmm. genuine. And I think other times it is, it is perhaps genuine but but timid. Um, you know, if, yeah. if 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 you know if you have a obviously there's a there's no proof. That's the really different thing. What you're talking about here is cases. You look at videos, you got conduct, right? And you get explanations which are hyper hyper technical or hyper legal well you know I said no 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 what is just what is right try the case educate the public have it be in the town square have everyone know um you know and and um and do it again you know I mean I, you know we had the exact same case we would do it again. Uh, so so Alvin just to wrap up I mean you talked today about uh, conversations that need to take place uh, the, the, the role of uh, all members of our communities, uh, you know, not just African American, but other minorities, white people especially, important to be aligned and involved and mm-hmm. understanding of the root uh, of, of the problem. Um, the protests that are happening, changes that have to be made at the institutional level. Um, I mean, where do you think? Where do you think the next, the very next step? Uh, where do you see the the very next step? Is is it the conversation? Is it focusing on the political process? Because it's an important election year. I mean, where do you see, you know, in the next several weeks? Uh, where, where would you like to see efforts made to to, to really start advance this issue in the best way? So, so I think it's all, all, all of the, you know, above, um, in that you know it can't be disaggregated, and so we each sort of bring, you know, particular things to those of, you know, those, those in Minnesota who are working on the case, they, that, that's got to be their priority for, you know, right. to, to litigate right. that matter. Um, you know, there've been talks mm-hmm. about, you know, perhaps a, you know, I don't know if it's the, in this this moment the Department of Justice is the one to lead it, but some sort of a systemic review like there was in Ferguson, and so there will be the role of, you know, folks who will need to bring civil litigation. Uh, and, and then I think, you know, folks need to continue to sort of be protesting and, 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 and engaging, you know, the power structure through, through our First Amendment uh, uh, rights that we see to continue and sustain this conversation. Uh, I do think that sort of over the next uh, months, I mean, New York, we've got, uh, you know, primaries in, coming up in three weeks. And I think the local level is very important. Uh, you know, we've mm-hmm. seen that mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the White House is important, but the State House is too, and you know, district Absolutely. attorneys and school boards. And so we have that in June, and I know there are others around the country. And then we also have November. Um, so all that's critical. And then we have the census, right? You know, we, you know, uh, mm-hmm. people have to continue to do mm-hmm. that. 
specifically on the issue of of policing and and uh, you know these police involved killings, I think there's some very important legislative issues percolating. So for years, really, in New York, uh, and I've been a part of the effort of trying to to to, to get get repealed uh, a law that you know has been interpreted to give very robust uh, protections to police records, which makes it hard to access you know uh, histories histories of, of, of substantiated complaints. And so you know we we know with uh, both Eric Garner and George Floyd that the officers involved there had you know had histories that should be uh, scrutinized. And so repealing that law will one allow more information, uh, uh, and then I think will allow sort of a public uh, early warning system, and I think also the private actors, the law enforcement should be much more robust in terms of, you know, officers who have had substantiated misconduct, you know, not using them in, in future you know, prosecutions and having an early warning system. I mean, the best thing we can do is sort of, you know, if you see a history, uh, you, know, uh, you know, stop it, you know, don't have the person out. So we're going to still, I think, learn more about uh, the officer and George Floyd as we go along. But I think those kind of specific legislative deliverables, I think, continuing mm-hmm. the conversation about the size of the criminal justice system and, and the types of the types of government interaction we need that keep us, you know, safer. You know, the conversation in New York having around the pandemic is, you know, you know, homelessness, you know, if we're you know, example example I give, you know, when I was a federal prosecutor, I did a I did a I did a mortgage fraud case against a former lawyer who uh, you know, basically destabilized, you know, parts of a neighborhood with his conduct. Um, you know, those kind of cases, you know, leading to kind of systemic change is where we should focus on the all too often our criminal justice system is focusing on the homeless person who's doing the trespassing, which in my view is that that's a public health issue. That's a you know, that's a housing insecurity issue. And so I think having that continue to be a part of the conversation and connecting it to um these you know, kind of what 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 are front burner because of all of the episodes, but but understand the ways in which we're using police and rethinking that, um, you know, the things that should not be criminal cases and shouldn't be policing mm-hmm. interactions. I think I want to see sustained conversation on that, but I also do want to see very specific things like, hey, we've got a attorney general investigating in Minnesota because the governor appointed. We have that kind of arrangement here in New York. Yeah by executive order. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that's the right structure, having someone who doesn't have a day in, day out relationship with the with the with the police he he's he's prosecuting. But that should be coded in by law. So we should have mm-hmm. law a law in New York. We, we should be thinking about mm-hmm. federal law that ties funding, you know, kind of the reverse of the nineteen ninety four uh crime bill that ties funding to things that increase transparency, increase accountability. A special prosecutor for this that's going to release a report, report out if there are no charges. Um, you know, things like that are these very specific things that the little eyes that are wearing my kind of lawyer hat will continue to talk about um, and, and many others, you know, community organizers and, and who've been fighting and pushing for these reforms in the legislature will continue to do that. And so, you know, that's part of the legislative process and wearing my lawyer hat, you know, continue to litigate you know, the case of uh, Eric Garner's family versus the city to get, get, get right. information there. So I think it's all of the above. We've got to protest, we've got to vote, we've got to sue, we've got to prosecute, we got to legislate, you know, we've got to educate, we've got to talk about racism, um, uh, we've got to vote, see the change of the White House. <laughs> as we've been uh, you know, it's, you know, it's exhausting. But it's, you said vote twice. Uh-huh. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Vote twice? Well, okay. Hey, we got we got to vote for You can't vote twice. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't vote twice. Right. But maybe that's the, my subconscious. Because we got June primaries, and we we got November. So, so I'm right. telling that's myself true. to vote twice. This is separate yeah, elections. People do have to vote. I, 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 I agree entirely with that. Just pulling out. What gives you hope over these next few weeks? What 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 are you hopeful about uh, that perhaps can at least take us a step in the right direction from where we are right now? Uh, Well, I'm hopeful in general right now because of just all 
like I've seen people who have never been engaged in anything around accountability for police engage. And so I'm just like excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm hopeful just in general. And I am waiting. I, I mean, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't uh, even give a, like, like my own prediction, because we see in these cases, and, and too many times how they turn. And then, you know, I don't want to be a pessimist, and I want to be optimistic. Uh, I also want to be realistic. Uh, so, like earlier in the fall, when I stated I don't use the term justice anymore, actually, I have a son named Justice. He's one year old. I had him after the trial, ironically, right? So, I had him after mm -hmm. the trial, and because I just felt it was just a terrible injustice, and it was the, 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 not, the guilty verdict was so hurtful to me. Like, um, the not guilty so verdict. The not guilty verdict. Yes. All right. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So the not guilty verdict was so hurtful to me that I just didn't know how to get past it. Right. Um. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, like, I, I. So then I ended up. I was pregnant. Uh, fall 2018. Right after the uh, trial. Right. So then I decided to make. To name my son justice because like I was like marching, rallying, I was doing like everything there is to do to make sure that Zaron would get a fear state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I say accountability because I have my justice now, right? And mm -hmm. I I I want to see accountability. I want to see people Treated humanely. I want to see black people treated humanely, uh, and and I, I also need for people to understand that there is no like it's not a choice. It, it's there. We we have there is no other country. choice. We yeah. yeah we we contribute to this country. We are a part of this country. There is just no choice. A lot of times when, um, because like earlier when we were speaking about, uh, I, I did a press conference for the budget hearing because the police here are set to get a large sum of money for like more policing. And what I had explained to them, because most oftentimes people think that I'm just an activist and organizer, I actually work for the city or for the Department of Health. And so mm -hmm. uh, just like the officer that killed my brother, I, I was on, on duty too, right? And so he mm -hmm. didn't lose. He actually gained. He, he, his pension wasn't impacted. His pay wasn't impacted. Nothing in his life was impacted financially. But I took a lot of losses. And I mean a lot of losses. And like I wasn't, I almost wasn't allowed to get my maternity leave because I was told by my union that I had used that time that would have allowed me, like I guess it is like an amount, of, an allotted amount of time in which you would be eligible for certain benefits, right? So they mm -hmm. told me that I used that time while sitting on trial for Wayne Isaac. I said, well, wait a minute. Wayne Isaac didn't lose anything. Wayne Isaac lost no money. And if Wayne Isaac had a baby today, he would get his maternity leave. So this is disgusting. So actually, yeah. I had uh, went against it four times. So, and it was denied each time. The fourth time, I wrote a very, very honest, open letter about how anti-black that is. So I work for a city, right, who refuses to give me what is owed to me simply because I had a baby, and another city employee killed my brother. I wasn't really sure what one thing had to do with the other. I said, and I'm not going to allow you all to make it seem as if there's a correlation, because to me, it isn't. 
we've taken entirely too many losses. The reason why I'm representing Delron is because my mom died when I was nine. Delron was 12. We grew up in foster care. We were all we had. Delron bathed me. He took care of me. He pretty much raised me because we grew up in a a, a hostel foster care home um, environment mm-hmm. and ultimately adopted the home, right? And so I felt I had no choice but to make yeah. sure I stood on trial for my brother. In turn, I wasn't going to be allowed maternity leave. So I had to reach out to the city council. The city councilman, actually, he, um, Denise Miller, he was the one who had gotten the maternity leave for me. So that's like, I felt at the time that it was an injustice in itself. And I think that oftentimes for people, I think it's also too the perception of people who are protesting and the people who are um, advocating or activist organizers. People think that we have no other life. Like we're just here, we're just there, we're just going around and we're doing this kind of third. But we have actual real lives. We have, we have jobs that we go to, uh, we right. have schools that we go to. Um, we uh, hopefully I'll finish pre law school sometime in the near future. Uh, I, I am working on becoming a lawyer. I, I have this pretty cool fellowship in DC working on uh, legislation. Um, That's great. As a contractor, well, right? But, but, but it's the perception. So it's the, the point of me saying all of that is it's the perception. So when we are thinking of George Floyd, we have to understand that these people have probably stopped going to their jobs. They have probably put things in their life on hold for what they believe in, just like I have done, because I have a whole life. And when people think that, like, you're not contributing, you know, quote, unquote, contributing to society, then they, then it, 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 they feel that um, your voice shouldn't be heard because you aren't contributing to society when that's actually the furthest thing from the truth. Well, the other the other aspect of what I what you, I think what I'm hearing and what you're saying, and I really appreciate you sharing that part of your story, is when you talk about valuing a life, mm-hmm. valuing a black person's life, you're also mm-hmm. talking about a family, you're talking about a community, and the impact of devaluing a life has has impact in it, you as a sister on your family on George Floyd's family on the community uh, where people live and work and uh, raise their children. And so this is, uh, you know, this is a very human problem we're talking about, deeply complex. And uh, I hope, I hope that, uh, I hope there's opportunities ahead for coming together. And um, I, I, again, Victoria, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us, for sharing the story, uh, the story of your brother, and the work you're doing. Uh, Alvin, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your experience and your perspective. Uh, and, as, and as well, thank you to Kristen Clark from the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights. Uh, I hope this is only just uh, the first of many conversations. I know for me personally, it, it, it will be. Uh, we'll continue to be talking about this on, on our podcast um, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, and uh, I hope, you know, it's a conversation that everybody has to be part of. It's sometimes hard, uh, but we all have to learn and uh, uh, come together to make this better. So thank you all for, um, you know, just the small part that we're playing today in, uh, in doing that. And, uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Thank you.